So we have uh, 86 um, people already on board. Uh, I believe there is a, 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 a Liz, uh, I don't know if you want to, um, I know there was a discussion around, uh, uh, there were many different people who uh, appropriately wanted to introduce you. And I don't know how we decided to, to pursue this because I'm 100 emails already behind this morning. So, uh, but uh, Liz, do you want to introduce the introducer for me? Um, I believe the uh, Dr. Joe Carr will be giving the introductions. I think that's where we left. Okay, Joe, are you on? Uh, Joe, you have to unmute your screen. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Great, great. It, it, is, it is my pleasure to, to do the introduction. Um, and um, we are very fortunate because we really have someone with us who needs no introduction. Certainly not to anyone in cardiology and certainly not to anyone at Yale. Um, Dr. Marvin actually is a Yale graduate. He completed his um, MD and PhD degrees at Yale and he did postdoctoral work at Yale before he um, subsequently went to Johns Hopkins for his medicine and cardiology training. Um, stayed at Johns Hopkins as a faculty member um, uh, ultimately um, received an endowed chair, uh, was the chief of cardiology, and he founded the uh, Hopkins Institute of uh, Cardiobiology and was there for, uh, for a while till 2007 when he subsequently transitioned to um, the West Coast and went to Cedar sinai um, as the executive director of the uh, Smith Heart Institute, and that's where he is now. Um, again, he is um, someone who needs no introduction. He's authored more than 400 peer-reviewed articles. He was the editor-in-chief of circulation research for over 10 years. Um, he really has been on the forefront of stem cell therapy, cardiac regeneration, and heart failure. He's also done a lot of work on uh, gene, gene therapy and the creation of biological pacemakers. And when we um, approached um, Eduardo last year to talk to us, we thought that those were gonna be the topics that we were gonna um, hear about, you know, biological pacemakers and stem cell therapy. And we envisioned that, you know, he would give uh, two talks, one more for the um, basic scientists um, and, um, and, and one more uh, for the, uh, and one more clinically oriented talk, uh, if you will. Um, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic kind of um, got in the way and um, we're not able to have them physically with us, but what this, what this does present is an opportunity to um, discuss a very timely topic, which is the um, topic of COVID-19 and the heart. And that's of interest to both basic scientists and, um, um, and clinicians alike. And um, we are really looking forward to uh, hearing from you, Eduardo, and uh, welcome back to your alma mater. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, Eric, and Jeff, and uh, all my other friends um, and colleagues at uh, Yale. As uh, Joe said, Yale holds a special place in my heart. I spent seven years there and um, look back on those days very fondly. Uh, and Barry Zaret, among others, uh, were uh, great uh, mentors uh, who uh, helped me in my career well after uh, the Yale years ended, and um, so I'm very grateful to everybody and to that experience. In this case, uh, I really um, feel a little bit like the butt of the joke that um, uh, Mark Twain made about the definition of an expert. Uh, he said an expert is uh, someone who doesn't know any more than you do, but is from out of town. Uh, in this particular um, topic, you know, which is so new, uh, it's easy to um, kind of fall into that uh, that trap. Um, and um, basically the um, reason that this is true is that the field is so new. The first publication on PubMed, if you do the double search on COVID and heart, appeared on February 18th. And as of a few days ago, this was up to um, 251. And as you can see, it's an exponential uh, rise. And if you just look at, at COVID, 
uh, recognizing that um, the term wasn't coined until the very end of January. There's already um, thousands, many thousands of citations. And this doesn't even include the uh, many papers that are deposited on preprint um, archives like uh, MedArchive and um, BioArchive, where the papers haven't yet been uh, peer reviewed. This uh, conceptually um, depicts the progression of the disease, I think, in a helpful uh, heuristic way. Although in any given patient, there's substantial overlap among these uh, phases. But certainly, there's the concept that uh, initially the viral response is somewhat generic in the sense of the host response to viral infection. This can be asymptomatic. Uh, in the laboratory, uh, there's uh, lymphocytopenia. But the patients that go on to become uh, symptomatic develop uh, bilateral pneumonias, uh, very abnormal chest imaging, often profound hypoxemia. And eventually, this becomes dominated by friendly fire from the immune system and a host response characterized by elevated inflammatory and cardiac biomarkers. And it's this hyperinflammation that itself might be a helpful therapeutic target above and beyond the sort of supportive measures that we can do for the pulmonary phase, uh, as well as anything therapeutically that we might be able to do to target the infection itself. Uh, this paper, which appeared in uh, Nature Medicine, gives you a somewhat different perspective from the kinds of statistics that you're used to seeing on uh, uh, New York Times and CNN, et cetera, in the sense that it dives a little deeper into what the biology of the epidemic is like and what underlies the unique clinical presentation of this um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, on the left-hand panel here is a, on the x-axis is r naught, which is the number of uh, infections that can be produced by any given index case. If it's less than one, the uh, epidemic self-extinguishes. If it's more than one, it perpetuates. For um, COVID, that number varies obviously regionally, uh, but uh, in general, it's been above two. Uh, and um, uh, on the y-axis here is the case fatality rate. So for something like Ebola, where the case fatality rate is uh, 50%, uh, public health measures such as extreme isolation uh, suffice to extinguish uh, that epidemic, um, and um, because it's so rapidly fatal and so uniformly symptomatic, um, it's in some ways easier to control even though it's uh, immediately deadlier. Uh, likewise, SARS is about 10% and the 800 some people died in that epidemic in 2002-2003. COVID-19 appears to have a case fatality rate of uh, somewhere in the, in the single digits. Uh, and we now recognize that many cases are asymptomatic. And so it's a perfect recipe for a pandemic, something to which the population has no immunity, that um, has a high or not value, uh, but a sufficiently low uh, case fatality that it can perpetuate throughout the population. If you look now at the inference from the public health data uh, as to what the symptomatic case fatality risk would be of those cases that are symptomatic, uh, how many die? There are um, basically very few deaths until the sixth decade of life, and then there's a monotonic increase. On the other hand, if you just look at how many patients with the infection are symptomatic, the asymptomatic rate is much higher. Basically, almost all patients are asymptomatic in the first two decades of life, and then progressively monotonically increase. And this is, of course, normalized to the fourth decade of life here. So uh, if you use all these insights and try to get at a real um, risk of dying after developing symptoms, it's about 1.4%, uh, which is much lower than the crude confirmed fatality rate. But if you now concede that maybe 20 to 90% of cases are asymptomatic, which is the range that we're talking about right now in the, in the epidemiological uh, literature, the overall probability of dying uh, of SARS-CoV-2 infection may be no higher than that of influenza. So I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna tell you a few sort of points today that include the fact that immune overreaction uh, kills people, 
that uh, angiotensin and converting enzyme 2 binds the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but nevertheless, its role in COVID-19 remains otherwise vague. Cardiac involvement is prominent. In terms of therapeutics, there's an overabundance of uh, pseudoscience, hype, and wishful thinking relative to evidence-based uh, medicine. And uh, finally, um, just a brief review of what the long-term sequelae might be. In point number one, immune overreaction, one of the cardinal signs of uh, COVID-19 is lymphocytopenia, and the lymphocytopenia appears to be um, predominantly due to T-cell depletion. In this recent series reported just a couple of days ago from uh, New York, uh, one can see that um, the reference range here for absolute lymphocyte counts is 1 to 3.3. And you can see that in the young uh, patients, uh, there are, was an, a fairly uh, normal uh, count. But as you get older, uh, even older than 18, uh, there's lymphocytopenia. And those who died have profound lymphocytopenia. And this is very similar to the conclusions reached earlier from the Wuhan data. Um, overall white count, uh, in this sorts in retro by retrospective assignment, um, in this case, survivors versus non-survivors, overall white count is not high at the beginning, which is typical of a viral infection, but then stays low in the, in the uh, individuals who go on to survive, but spikes due to a granulocytosis in the uh, patients who are non-survivors. Meanwhile, lymphocytes actually are depressed early on in both survivors and non-survivors, but in the non-survivors, they progressively decline, whereas in the survivors, they tend to recover. Um, and this is seen in a separate cohort here in terms of recovery from lymphocytopenia in survivors and progressive lymphocytopenia in non-survivors. Now, going back to the SARS-CoV um, epidemic of 2002 and 2003, where there's a little more science um, than basic science than there is as of now in the um, COVID-19 epidemic, they went back uh, and uh, looked at uh, pathological specimens co collected from patients who had um, severe uh, SARS or who uh, had died of SARS. And um, found that by electron microscopy, they could identify a viral inclusion uh, particles in different kinds of white blood cells, granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes. But um, really very few of the granulocytes had apparent uh, infection by electron microscopy. Monocytes uh, more so, um, but just over half of lymphocytes had these typical inclusion bodies. And perhaps that accounted uh, clinically for the fact that uh, there was T-cell uh, depletion, which seemed to be mostly due to helper T-cell depletion, although there was a small uh, decrease that's non-significant in cytotoxic T-cells as well. And just to reiterate, this is actually a fairly old paper now from the SARS um, uh, epidemic of 2003, but very recently um, in patients um, from uh, China, uh, very similar findings have been reported with a decrease in total T lymphocytes, no change in B lymphocytes, interestingly, and um, statistically significant decreases both in CD4 and CD8 T cells, but not in NK cells. And this is uh, distinguishing between severe and moderate cases. Now, what about this concept of systemic inflammation and cytokine storm? Well, it's prominent in COVID-19 patients. Again, the New York experience shows that if you look at all hospitals, uh, uh, all, all patients hospitalized with COVID-19 from this uh, series from JAMA, um, a number of these um, somewhat nonspecific markers of inflammation, uh, notably ferritin and C-reactive protein are elevated. And look at C-reactive protein. Here, the, um, the reference range is up to 0.4. Uh, and the, uh, but the uh, values ranged from 6.4 to 26.9. So every patient had uh, an elevated, these are confidence intervals, of course, but most of the patients with, fell, fell well within an abnormal range for C-reactive protein. There was less discriminatory value for procalcitonin. And as I'll show you later, D-dimer is specifically elevated in a very uh, severely ill uh, subset of patients. So um, 
this is one indication of another cytokine, uh, IL-6, and its uh, prognostic value, at least when viewed uh, retrospectively. Uh, IL-6 is elevated uh, in uh, non-survivors and becomes progressively more elevated over time, whereas it remains low in patients who survive. Uh, likewise, ferritin, uh, although ferritin is somewhat less uh, uh, discriminatory than uh, IL-6. And then another cohort from China, um, survivors versus uh, non-survivors, um, both interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein had uh, strong uh, discriminatory value. What about the whole thing about angiotensin converting enzyme uh, two? Um, well, there's certainly a theoretical basis uh, for susceptibility differences in infection and in patterns of infection, but there's very little data uh, that demonstrate the benefits or detriments of renin angiotensin aldosterone system antagonists, which has been a, a major controversy in the field. So ACE2 happens to bind, happens to bind, it is the uh, functional receptor for the uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV uh, from the SARS epidemic, and now also SARS-CoV-2, uh, and the um, uh, interaction between the spike protein and the ACE2 molecule has, has been resolved at uh, atomic uh, scale. Um, one interesting uh, thing that may explain um, why nasal swabs uh, can detect patients who are otherwise somewhat asymptomatic is that the goblet cells uh, in the ciliated cells of the nasal epithelium are extremely rich in ACE2 receptors. This is from a recent uh, paper in uh, Nature Medicine. Whereas as you go lower in the airway, there are receptors, but they're, um, they're less uh, uh, expressed, less richly expressed. So it's quite possible just on the basis of this to rationalize why you might have florid viral infection in the nose and yet um, no uh, lung symptoms. What about the implications for the heart? Now here the, the reasoning is somewhat uh, tangential and at the uh, level of plausibility, but just bear with me as I go through this somewhat belabored argument. The first piece of evidence is that if you knock out ACE2 and otherwise normal mice, they develop a uh, cardiomyopathy with poor left ventricular function. And this is uh, work that's now uh, 18 years old that has nothing per se to do with COVID and is an extreme because these are knockout mice. But if you also recognize that uh, SARS-CoV infection anyway lowers uh, ACE2 gene expression, and there's emerging data with, with SARS-CoV-2 that, uh, that shows this to be likewise true in that case, um, there's a depression in the transcript levels. And so it's conceivable if you put this together with this, that uh, that SARS-CoV um, infection decreases ACE2 and would thereby depress cardiac function, but there's really no corollary data in humans uh, or with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and in fact, cardiac dysfunction is not that um, prominent a feature of um, COVID as far as we know um, from the limited echocardiography that's available. Um, certainly cardiac involvement is common, but cardiac dysfunction is uh, less common. What about the whole controversy of whether uh, patients with uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs are maybe more susceptible to the disease? Well, if anything, this happens, this appears to be the reverse insofar as hospitalized patients in this very recently published series who were on ACEs or ARBs had a lower overall mortality than patients who weren't. And this is an observational study, it's not an interventional study, so this may or may not reflect differences in underlying uh, confounding factors. Um, cardiac involvement, well, it's touted as a major cause of death. Um, Troponin and I and BNP elevations are very common and are associated with poor outcome. Just to anticipate at least one of the conclusions, the extent of genuine myocarditis is unclear. So what is the prevalence of biomarker elevations? It appears to be uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 30 percent. But if you look at this uh, series uh, from uh, China, which was relatively large, uh, at least 40 percent of the cases were attributed of mortality, were attributed exclusively to heart in 33 percent of the cases, and another 7 percent were cardiorespiratory. So 
to me, it's a little bit surprising that biomarker elevations would be less common than the underlying uh, cause of mortality. But um, these are two different, these are three different studies, actually. So uh, what about the association, at least, of cardiac injury with increased mortality? Here from one uh, case uh, uh, series, uh, there's a, a big increase in uh, troponin and I in patients who died, uh, as opposed to those who were discharged healthy. And um, there's a not only an increase in troponin, but a progressive increase in those who go on to die versus a flat line in those who survive. Um, it's also uh, true that um, ARDS is uh, common, of course, and, and cardiac injury as a as witnessed by cardiac biomarkers is uh, common. And this is a Cox regression analysis, so it's putatively prognostic in, in this case. Potential mechanisms of cardiac injury include secondary effects of the immunopathology and the hyperinflammation, um, direct myocardial injury by infection uh, by the virus, or effects secondary to the systemic uh, hypoxemia, and the sequelae of any of these can be um, increased biomarkers, arrhythmias, uh, in principle, acute coronary syndromes, and different kinds of heart failure, either with preserved or reduced ejection fraction. In terms of whether the damage to the heart is direct or indirect, there are several case studies of fulminant myocarditis. Uh, here are two, for example, uh, that showed uh, inflammatory infiltrates, um, and it's possible that subclinical, subclinical myocarditis may be common, but the true incidence is not uh, known, but fulminant myocarditis is quite rare. In these two cases, there was no evidence. In fact, there was evidence against direct viral infection, but in this endomyocardial biopsy specimen of a patient who went on to die, not of myocarditis, but of um, complex multi-system failure from Italy, uh, the endomyocardial biopsy uh, electron microscopy revealed uh, evidence of viral, viral particles. So um, this is not that different from what uh, was known from the uh, SARS-CoV, um, from the SARS epidemic, in which um, about a third of the patients were associated with, uh, um, who went to autopsy anyway, were associated with direct evidence of viral infection in the heart as opposed to two thirds who were not, who had inflammatory lesions in the heart but did not have evidence of direct infection. Uh, in this uh, recent New England Journal paper, which looked at 18 patients in the New York area pooled from various centers that went on to have ST elevations, uh, they divided uh, and were taken to, to the cath lab. They divided these into patients who actually had myocardial infarction and those who had non-coronary myocardial injury. And what's notable here is if you're presented with such a patient in the emergency room, what can you do to sort of try to guess whether this is a genuine acute coronary syndrome or, or just a hyperinflammation? Uh, the ejection fraction was normal in most of the cases with uh, uh, who had non-coronary injury, whereas it was um, abnormal in most of the cases who, who did. Um, and um, the mortality was exceptionally high in, uh, in both of these uh, groups. Uh, what about the association uh, with um, blood pressure? There certainly seems to be a growing body of literature that background hypertension uh, is a risk factor along with diabetes and obesity um, and perhaps other chronic illnesses. Uh, but um, there was this early report in The Lancet that uh, was somewhat confusing in the sense that on presentation, patients who ended up being in the ICU were actually hypertensive in this series, uh, which is not what we associate with the usual viral uh, vasoplegia in an acutely ill patient. And indeed, in, in most subsequent uh, series, um, well, in all the subsequent series of which I'm aware, and certainly those from the United States, um, most of the patients who are critically ill um, are pressure dependent and have a low uh, blood pressure, as one might expect, whether or not they had baseline hypertension. Uh, there's certainly at least a theoretical basis for conjecture that maybe the risk of acute myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndromes may be elevated in COVID-19, but very little data to actually support the idea that there's an increased incidence. Uh, 
Um, there's a thrombotic proclivity in COVID-19. I've already told you that there's a general association of elevated D-dimer, and that is associated with uh, poor outcomes, um, massive elevations in uh, D-dimers in non-survivors relative to survivors. Uh, and um, the D-dimer levels appear, appear to be higher. This is, again, that uh, small case series from uh, New York of 18 patients with acute coronary syndrome does seem to be, the D-dimer elevations did seem to be associated somewhat with um, the patients who went on to have true myocardial infarction as opposed to those that have non-coronary uh, myocardial injury. Again, an association, but consistent at least with the idea that there may be a causal relationship between the systemic thrombotic state and the uh, acute myocardial infarction. And there's a long literature, which I won't belabor, uh, on the interface between inflammation and thrombosis, but certainly among the contributing factors are endothelial and smooth muscle cell activation, macrophage activation, and tissue factor expression, which is known to be increased in the atheromatous plaque, and uh, the proclivity towards platelet activation with additional production of pro-inflammatory mediators. In previous epidemics of influenza, RSV, and other viruses, there has been a significant association between those respiratory infections and acute MI with an incidence ratio ranging from uh, 2 to 11. But the true incidence of acute coronary syndrome and acute MI in COVID-19 is currently unknown. And given how many patients have COVID-19 uh, and how uh, static, in fact, decreasing the volumes have been in our cath labs, one makes you wonder if um, there's some paradox going on here. Um, this is all comers to um, present with acute coronary syndromes, but recent data in the United States have shown a plummeting use of cath labs for primary PCI. The same thing has uh, been seen in Spain. And if you look at the United Kingdom, this is not the uh, Dow Jones average, it's the uh, number of cardiac patients visiting emergency rooms, and this plummeted in um, the height of the uh, uh, COVID crisis in uh, the UK. Uh, this is to say that fewer patients are coming to be seen. Our impression is that they're um, uh, very late after the, present, after the onset of chest pain. Um, in extremis rather than early on as they might ordinarily have. And how many uh, occult MIs there are going on in the general population is unknown. It's possible, of course, too, that behavioral factors related to social isolation or age or reduce, reduced air pollution or um, reduced physical stress may uh, be also contributory factors to a genuine decline in uh, the incidence of acute coronary syndromes. <clears throat> Arrhythmias are said to be common, but are very poorly characterized. Uh, in this um, study, for example, there were as a description of palpitations and no more description. Um, in this admission EKG from a 31-year-old patient uh, in Wuhan with a multi-system failure who went on to recover, uh, there was an admission uh, SVT, likely sinus tachycardia. Um, and um, certainly there is a general association with tachycardia and uh, presentation in presentation vitals of the patients who are hospitalized uh, with uh, COVID-19 in the American, the most, in the largest American series. This is a somewhat deviant data point in the sense that it's isolated at this point, but in this uh, study it was claimed, in these studies it was claimed that um, BT and VF were uh, relatively common. Uh, these were small series. Um, and um, we haven't seen this, at least in the uh, 300 plus patients that we've treated at, at Cedar sinai And I'd be curious to hear what the, the Yale experience is. Uh, but arrhythmias are said to be more common in patients who are in the ICU, not surprisingly, than those who are not in the ICU. Well, this is just an ascertainment difference because of uh, continuous monitoring remains to be seen. What about therapeutics? Well, um, there's the possibility of using uh, antibodies against IL-6 or IL-6 receptors. And other than to note that there have been some isolated case studies with dramatic uh, resolution of illness, 
Um, I won't do anything other than to acknowledge the fact that if IL-6 is not just a biomarker of disease, but is actually contributing to the illness, this might be a very logical approach to use tocilizumab or related uh, compounds. Uh, you all know about the controversies regarding hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine plus or minus azithromycin, but let me just give you, a, you know, my own perspective on that. Um, the, the best uh, placebo-controlled study so far of therapeutics in, um, in COVID-19 was a, a paper published on this anti-HIV cocktail, lopinavir and ritonavir, which showed some in vitro evidence of efficacy against uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, but clinically um, had no uh, benefit in a placebo-controlled trial looking at least at cumulative improvement rate. Um, remdesivir, which has been very hyped and is a, a Gilead compound and compassionate case series, seemed to indicate uh, benefit without any controls, at least in a randomized clinical trial from China that was leaked and then prematurely released to, uh, w to the World Health Organization and then uh, withdrawn um, pending um, uh, curation, presumably. Um, it showed no benefit of uh, remdesivir, um, sending the Gilead stock uh, down sharply. Uh, in terms of hydroxychloroquine, despite a lot of initial hype uh, and some in vitro evidence uh, against uh, for efficacy in a, in a largely VA study uh, that's been uh, posted on uh, Med Archive only, there's no uh, benefit to hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, plus azithromycin. Uh, and likewise in a recent uh, French cohort, but there's no high quality peer reviewed uh, RCT data available yet. Uh, certainly there's nothing in the literature right now uh, that can defend the wholesale use of these compounds uh, either prophylactically or in, in patients. But one thing we know for sure is that the combination of azithromycin and uh, hydroxychloroquine agents with indivi which individually are known to increase the uh, QT interval and lead to torsade de pointe um, is uh, certainly the case. And this is seen in uh, Med Archive series, both from NYU Langone and from uh, our institution. So one has to balance the theoretical risk of benefit versus the known uh, risk of side effects. Steroids are used uh, somewhat uh, empirically in uh, COVID-19 but at least this meta-analysis, not only of a SARS-CoV-2 experience, but also lumping in some data from, um, from MERS and the SARS, from the uh, Mediterranean Respiratory Syndrome and the SARS epidemic, um, all coronaviruses uh, tend to favor control over corticosteroids in terms of overall outcomes. So there's no solid data uh, in favor of using corticosteroids in any uh, subset of COVID-19 patients. What about the concept of uh, cell therapy? And this is one where I can add some, uh, some personal uh, experience. Um, the first type of cell to be used in COVID were uh, mesenchymal stem cells, which had been tried without much uh, success, but at least with a safety profile in, uh, in different kinds of ARDS. Uh, the mesenchymal stem cells can be derived from various tissues, but the ones used here were from the bone marrow, and these are said to be able to differentiate, at least in vitro, to different uh, uh, lineages relevant to the musculoskeletal system. But the interesting feature of the cells with regard to COVID uh, is the fact that they're immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory, uh, and uh, therefore uh, there's some rationale. And this figure from a, a, a paper that was um, uh, from, uh, from China, um, uh, which compared three controls to seven non-critically ill patients treated with MSCs. Curiously, only three and three were, were uh, compared, so I don't know what happened to the other four patients who were treated with MSCs, but there was supposedly an increase in beneficial cytokine IL-10 in the MSC-treated patients, an increase in VEGF, and a decrease in uh, TNF-alpha, uh, but no... Um, significant evidence of, of clinical improvement in a subset of patients that, in a set of patients who were not uh, critically ill to begin with. Um, the 
the cell type that I've been working on for the last um, uh, 14 years or so is uh, the cardiosphere derived cell. And this is a um, cardiac stromal cell that can be derived from human uh, hearts uh, by a straightforward uh, culture method, uh, which um, starts with bits of, uh, of human heart tissue, goes through a cardiosphere stage in which it, adhesion in vitro is repelled and the cells self-assemble into spherical clusters called cardiospheres and then replating those clusters on um, planar um, uh, culture media um, yields the cell product of cardiosphere derived cells. And these cells um, work by secreting extracellular vesicles uh, called exosomes and these uh, extracellular vesicles produce cardiomyogenesis, angiogenesis and antifibrotic effects but a particular relevance to COVID, uh, they promote cardiomyocyte survival, they're anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory. And um, these uh, cells have been now in over 200 patients in various uh, clinical trials. The uh, clinical development efforts are um, most advanced for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where there's not only the published HOPE trial, but an interim analysis of the placebo-controlled double-blind um, uh, randomized clinical trial called HOPE-2, which followed, uh, show uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, data in, in favor of the cell therapy group, in this case, having gotten intravenous therapy uh, in HOPE-2, uh, and likewise intravenous therapy for um, pulmonary hypertension in the ongoing uh, alpha uh, trial. But the other cases were all intracoronary delivery. Um, so why use CDCs over mesenchymal stem cells? Well, at least in a head-to-head -head comparison, uh, in this case of uh, anti-apoptotic effects, CDCs were more uh, efficacious in vitro than either bone marrow-derived or adipose tissue-derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And likewise, in a myocardial infarction model, the uh, recovery from myocardial infarction functionally was highest in the uh, CDC group uh, relative to the other comparator cell types. On a uh, more uh, mechanistic level, um, if you look at the extracellular vesicle contents that are secreted from either uh, cardiosphere-derived cells or MSCs, uh, there is a significantly higher proportion that's apparently bioactive in uh, CDCs versus MSCs. MSCs can, MSC exosomes contain a lot of what we might describe as starch, um, transfer RNAs and other molecules that don't have plausible um, uh, disease-modifying bioactivity, whereas CDCs are much richer, CDC exosomes are much richer in those. And the microRNA uh, payloads, not the, the um, determinants of bioactivity are limited to microRNA within EVs, but they're quite different in the uh, EVs that come from CDCs versus MSCs. And it's just one example, microRNA um, 146A, which has been associated previously with disease modifying bioactivity of CDC exosomes is, um, and this is on a log scale, is much higher by orders of magnitude in the different, these are different sources from different donors of CDC EVs than in uh, MSC EVs. So then, even though um, it's tempting to think of cell therapy as all one bucket, uh, there may be reason to believe that CDCs are different from and superior to MSCs, at least uh, theoretically. So if you look at uh, COVID-19 pathogenesis and you take lessons from both the SARS-CoV uh, epidemic and SARS-CoV-2 and look at the, what's known about what's going on with uh, T cells and what's conjecturally plausible in terms of macrophage involvement, production of cytokines, systemic inflammation, and different uh, disease processes. And every one of these hinge points uh, is indicated by these numbers. There, are, uh, ev there is evidence of disease-modifying bioactivity of CDCs or their exosomes, and in different models uh, relevant to cardiac inflammation, lung inflammation, cardiomyocyte death, cardiac dysfunction, skeletal muscle injury, or tissue fibrosis we have ample preclinical evidence for uh, efficacy. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, um, in terms of clinical development, the uh, disease for which uh, product development is most advanced, and this is, a, this is work of um, biotechnology company Capricorp, which I was a founder, um, 
uh, is uh, most advanced uh, for Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, which as you know, has both uh, cardiac and uh, skeletal myopathy. What about um, other evidence that's specific to COVID? Well, um, this is in COVID, but in, a, in an aging uh, model of HEFPEF, -hef, uh, administration of CDCs was associated with decreases in IL-6 and in IL-1B, both of which are elevated in COVID. In an unpublished work from uh, my lab, we now know that CDC exosomes uh, increase the proliferation of regulatory T cells, which are um, depressed, as I mentioned, in patients with COVID-19. Uh, not only uh, are, is proliferation of regulatory T cells uh, increased, but also they're activated to produce tremendously higher levels of IL-10. So both of these effects would, would tend to be in the right direction to antagonize what's known about the cytokine storm and the hyperinflammation state of COVID. Uh, and in a, finally, in a, a model of experimental autoimmune uh, myocarditis where CDCs have previously been shown to be effective by uh, Costas Meliaris and colleagues in, uh, in Athens, uh, we find uh, CDC exosomes to improve uh, functional uh, recovery, uh, decrease QT prolongation, and decrease um, inflammation severity. Again, unpublished work. So this has all led to uh, the CS cubed uh, studies, uh, CDCs for cytokine storm in COVID syndrome. Um, the inclusion criteria are confirmed uh, COVID-19. So far, the patients we've treated are uh, critically ill, uh, almost all uh, intubated, and uh, another one most recently treated on high flow uh, nasal uh, oxygen. They all have lymphocytopenia and some subset of elevated IL-6, troponin, and myoglobin, or CRP levels. Um, the experience to date is, uh, is all compassionate use uh, and uh, is limited to six cases. The intervention is uh, intravenous CAP-1002, which is the formulation of allogeneic CDCs made by uh, Capricor and used to date in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other clinical studies. Administration is uh, up to two doses weekly, um, depending on clinical course as to whether they get the second do dose. Uh, and the outcomes are exploratory, including mortality, length of ICU stay, escalation of support, and uh, all the biomarkers that we can uh, we can uh, gather uh, that are clinically um, indicated. Uh, from a regulatory viewpoint, as I said, the first six patients have been treated by uh, emergency use uh, INDs. But very recently, an expanded use IND was awarded to Capricor that will uh, permit the study of an additional 20 patients in an open label fashion. Uh, so far, here's the experience. We've, we've uh, recruited um, uh, six patients ranging in age from 19 to 75 with significant comorbidities. The major comorbidity in the, the young patient was uh, obesity. All of the patients had ARDS. Uh, all five of these patients were intubated. The most recent one is on high flow nasal cannula. And um, I can't tell you that this is anything but natural history of the disease, but we're fortunate, at least so far, that all the patients have survived. Three have been discharged to home, two are on the uh, floor, and um, one that remains uh, intubated and critically ill. Uh, are there uh, long-term uh, sequelae? Uh, well, it's the COVID epidemic is too young to know that for sure, but the lessons learned from SARS a uh, COV um, infection uh, may be uh, instructive here. And conceptually, uh, we think of it as an acute phase, which is really the, the, the hospitalization, uh, and then a convalescent, perhaps, uh, as patients are waiting in the hospital to have two negative uh, uh, swabs or recently discharged from home, and this might be arbitrarily um, classified as the weeks to months phase. And then, of course, there's months to years, which is where we don't have any data for, um, for COVID. Um, in the acute phase, I've already reviewed what happens uh, clinically. Uh, there's some evidence, and this is mostly at the level of hearsay or case reports, that in the convalescent phase, there may be a delayed myocarditis, and this is at the case report phase, or cases of asystole or cardiac arrest, when we think the patient is getting better, all of a sudden they die. Um, not very common, but common enough that it's been remarked upon. 
And then chronically, it's all speculation for COVID-19, but at least for SARS survivors, um, many of them develop hyperlipidemia, pulmonary fibrosis, and hypertension. So we have to be vigilant to these long-term sequelae that uh, may not uh, yet be apparent after having survived a, a SARS uh, CoV-2 infection. So just to reiterate what I've told you, uh, immune overreaction kills people. The role of ACE2 in terms of being receptor is well established but the, for infection, but the overall role in the clinical course of COVID-19 is otherwise vague. Cardiac involvement is prominent, but mm, perhaps mostly at the level of biomarkers, and it's not yet clear what the clinical impact of the cardiac involvement is. Um, the therapeutics uh, still uh, marked by a paucity of evidence-based medicine, which for us as cardiologists is very frustrating since so much of our practice is uh, evidence-guided. And then um, I've reviewed for you briefly what the possibilities are in terms of long-term sequelae. I'd like to conclude by um, acknowledging um, a few key individuals here at Cedars-Sinai. Shah Akhmarov is a surgical resident who's uh, in my laboratory and has done the unpublished work on uh, T cells and on experimental acute uh, myocarditis. He also uh, helped me put together this talk. Um, uh, and he's a part of a think tank of, in the lab that includes uh, Ahmed Ibrahim, Jeff Dekuto, and Russell Rogers for novel ways of dealing with uh, COVID using the tools that we know how to use. Raj Makar, uh, who is the um, uh, director of um, intervention at uh, Cedar sinai and, and a vice president in our institution, uh, is the uh, principal investigator for the uh, COVID uh, CS cube uh, studies. Um, and of course, they, um, we benefited from a product and regulatory product provision and regulatory guidance uh, in collaboration from Capricor. Funding for my lab includes funding from the NIH, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, the DOD, and, and from uh, Coalition uh, Duchenne. And um, this is where uh, we are. Uh, 300 uh, days of the year tend to be very sunny and nice here. Uh, today is no exception. Um, and um, sometimes this, um, Natural beauty is jarring when juxtaposed with the reality of the COVID, uh, social isolation, et cetera. Anyway, um, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, updating you, at least on my own uh, perspectives on COVID-19. I'd be happy to take uh, any questions according to what your uh, policy would be for that. Thank you, Eduardo. That was a wonderful talk. Um, uh, as I uh, maybe uh, will ask people to kind of just jump in with questions, but maybe I'll start with one, which is um, you shared with us this uh, you know, exciting um, foray uh, into the cardiosphere treatment of, um, of COVID-19. And I'm just curious if you could share with us your experience and, and, and uh, thoughts behind the progression from, you know, uh, experimental INDs, um, uh, through to kind of more um, uh, concrete RCT type comparisons and what do you see the pathway for that kind of activity um, in, in the midst of our pandemic? Yeah, no, I, um, I think given the urgency of the situation and the fact that we could waste a lot of time uh, doing open label studies that ultimately are anecdotal, um, we are on a very fast track to an RCT um, we've already um, come up with a protocol that we're going to present to FDA, and we're actively looking for um, funding sources, um, peer-reviewed funding sources for trials that would range in size from uh, 100 to 300 patients with an adaptive design, um, looking really at hard uh, clinical endpoints um, to see if there's any justification for this kind of therapy. I think the sooner we get real RCT data, um, the better we are in the, the shorter the hype period and the, the longer the evidence-based period, the better off we'll be as a society. This isn't true just for cell therapy, but also for all these other um, things that have been touted. Eduardo, this is Jeff Bender. Um, welcome, welcome back. That's a real welcome back, even if a virtual 
virtual visit. Um, it's, uh, I'll remind everyone that Eduardo was one of our illustrious Calabrese lecturers some years back. And uh, so this is also a return visit. Um, I, uh, my question is a little bit about timing, and that's what's obviously complicated therapy of this illness so much because there obviously one needs an effective immune response early to the virus, and then we all talk about inflammatory cytokine storm later. And I think regulatory T cells are a good example of where you would want a minimal Treg you wouldn't want to be over, overwhelmed with Tregs early because you need an effector T cell response early, but then um, late, it's probably a good idea to modulate and dampen the immune response. Um, even that said, Tregs are great producers of TGF beta, so the pulmonary fibrosis issue is, is kind of complicated. So I wonder if you could comment on timing. I mean, your trial, you said your CS3 trial is a compassionate use, uh, critically ill patient trial. Is that the right time point to be intervening at this level? Should it be earlier? Should it even be early? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Jeff. Uh, and um, conceptually, that first um, slide that I showed, which distinguishes the, in, you know, the acute infection from the ARDS from the hyperinflammation is, um, I think, heuristically informative uh, and would, if that were true, it would support the general notion that we want to use uh, antivirals early or at least things that will suppress the infection but won't suppress immunity. And then as the uh, clinical course progresses, it's more logical to use things that would uh, target the uh, lymphocytopenia and the hyperinflammation and cytokine storm. Um, and I don't want to be such a um, victim of dogma that that premise, which is really a concept, guides the, the whole uh, therapeutic principles. Um, but it certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, and everything you've said is correct. So that certainly guided our use of cell therapy, um, not trying to mess with anything that might involve the primary infection, but really uh, going after the manifestations of advanced disease where there's every reason to believe that reversing the Treg uh, depletion and the uh, hyperinflammation might be uh, therapeutically valuable. But, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that um, patients who are generally immunosuppressed, uh, in a colloquial way at least, you know, pregnant uh, women, um, patients who are uh, uh, being treated uh, by various chronic uh, immunosuppressive regimens for rheumatoid uh, diseases, uh, patients who are being treated for cancer. Th there hasn't been exactly an explosion of uh, epidemiology signifying that there's a heightened risk of severe infection in these subsets of patients who are not exactly rare subsets. So they're, and you know, when you think about why are bats the reservoirs of so many of these diseases, uh, there's some thought that bats are uh, intrinsically immunosuppressed because their wing beating frequency is so high that they're constantly chewing up their own tissues and uh, and then and hence they're they're already primed immunologically not to react to self, and then they're also this amazing reservoir for these viruses, but they don't get sick from the viruses. So it's I'm acknowledging that everything you said I think is true, but I also think maybe the plot thickens a little bit when you actually look at the biology of this unique uh, coronavirus. Thanks. Uh, uh, Dr. Marvin, uh, this is Ibin from uh, Cardiovascular Risk Center. Thank you for this exciting talk. So I'm wondering, has your lab tested whether SARS-CoV-2 directly could infect the CDC cells? We haven't, uh, we haven't looked at whether SARS can infect um, 
CDCs, but what we have been trying to do is to rule out, and this is in collaboration with a BSL-3 facility uh, at uh, UCLA, um, to rule out the theoretical possibility that um, by using these therapies, we might potentiate the infection, which I think would be a, a um, you know, the kind of side effect that we would want to know about before we use the therapy. Um, we don't have any data on that yet, but I think it's sufficiently um, compelling that we're trying yeah. to exclude. Uh, another quick question. Uh, if you would like to administer uh, CDC, which stage of during the patient the infection do you want to uh, apply this wonderful reagent? Early stage, late stage, or mid stage? Well, this is... Um, a restating of, uh, of Jeff's uh, question, but um, I, um, I certainly can't um, advocate at, on the basis of anything we know, the use in mildly uh, sick patients or in uh, asymptomatic patients. Uh, there has to be some evidence uh, of the whole rationale is immunomodulatory and um, anti-inflammatory. And therefore, um, I, th I think we would bias towards the sicker patients. Now, whether we are missing an, an opportunity by focusing only on critically ill patients is quite theoretically possible. So we're going to, if we do an RCT, or I should say when we do an RCT, because it's already in the advanced planning stages, we're not gonna limit it to patients on ventilators and um, um, who are already uh, you know, critically ill but we probably will limit it to patients who require supplemental oxygen and are at least moderately sick. Thank you. Dr. Marban, this is Ari. Uh, a very nice talk. I enjoyed it a lot. You mentioned initial uh, uh, episode of hypertension in some patients and, um, you know, and a down regulation of ACE2, which kind of raises the question whether the angiotensin 2 actually plays the role in initial hypertension, especially it's very intriguing that hypertensive patients are at very high risk. And then you mentioned about the role of ACE2 and cardiomyopathy and you know, the loss of it in mice causing cardiomyopathy. I wonder, can you say anything in the effect of uh, the treatment of the soluble ACE2? Where is that going? And would that be beneficial uh, by obviously lowering the and uh, kind of virus itself to some, some other place than the, the pulmonary epithelial cells, as well as actually using ACE2 for a treatment, uh, maybe contracting angiotensin 2, maybe also helping with the heart failure. Right, so there is, um, a, using that line of reasoning, there is a clinical trial, um, or at least a, a clinical intervention ongoing uh, using uh, recombinant ACE2 infusion. Uh, and the rationale is to have this serve as a decoy receptor that would tie up uh, virus and, and cause it from uh, infecting or prevent it from infecting cells or, or perpetuating the cycle of infection. But other than to note that that's being done, uh, I have no knowledge of any clinical data yet using that approach. So Joseph, I, um, uh, I acknowledge that it's very near the end of the hour. I'll let you, um, you or Eric or Jeff, decide when to, when to end the Q&A period. I'm happy to keep going. So, we're, so uh, Eduardo, first of all, thank you on behalf of the entire section and, and all of Yale for uh, first going back to your, uh, your home. Uh, uh, of sorts and uh, for, for uh, remotely educating us uh, uh, this afternoon. I would say um, I hope you're okay if people um, reach out uh, uh, to you directly if they have additional questions. Um, and, uh, and I uh, really again want to thank you for taking the time for the work you're doing and, and I, I hope to uh, hear the, the uh, what we've learned from the cardiosphere work uh, uh, when you come here in person uh, next time. So, so with that, I'll close today's uh, Grand Rounds and, and on behalf of everyone, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.